Good afternoon and thank you. Thank you and welcome to this Mary Seacole Memorial Lecture entitled Why is Racism Killing Nurses? The NHS has been built, developed and sustained by various migrant populations. Their contribution is often met with racism and remains largely unrecognized. <clears throat> Black nurses are more likely to be referred to the NMC for fitness to practice by their employers and are like, less likely to be shortlisted for or be successful at senior positions and occupy the lower hierarchy of the profession. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, they have been disproportionately affected. Join me in this lecture as I discuss how racism is killing nurses. Next slide, please. I'm honored to be delivering this memorial lecture. I'm a Mary Seacole scholar, and in 2013-14, I was awarded the Mary Seacole Leadership Award for Nursing. This changed my thinking and the way I view the health of Black people and their positions within society. I define Black as anyone who identifies as non-white. I endeavor to share knowledge and enlighten you as previous speakers such as Helen Bevan in 2015 and my mentor and their friend, Professor Laura Sarant in 2019. Our worldview is shaped by our interactions with society, which is made up of groups and individuals. Each have their own markings and are personal and public. In other words, their culture is what gives them their identity. In this lecture, I approach, I approach this lecture in three parts. Firstly, why I can talk openly and challenge racism. So this is due to my position and my own identity. Secondly, how race has been constructed over the years to other anyone who identifies as non-white. And thirdly, to look at how racism through othering is killing nurses. <clears throat> Next slide, please. My name is Calvin Morley. I'm a professor of diversity and social justice at London South Bank University. I was educated as a nurse in this country. And for over 25 years experience, I have worked in a critical care setting, most mainly intensive, cardiothoracic intensive care. Originally, I am from the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad is noted for lots of stuff. And in one of my images here, you can see we have what we call mass or people call carnival. Mass and re really and truly came from the shortened name of the word masquerade, because it's part of our heritage. Because we were slaves, we had the one day where slaves could mimic their masters, so they dressed up like them. They masqueraded as the white slave owners. And this has now evolved as part of our culture, where it's much more reveling in the streets. But that's the, the root of, of carnival in Trinidad. We have lovely stretches of beach on our coastal area. And if you were like me and you grew up, our after-school activity was playing cricket in the road. Next slide, please. So who am I? Identity. If the political events in the last 18 months have taught us anything, it is that our cultural identity is bound up with our race. The two are very intertwined. There is never one without the other. Our culture and identity therefore positions where we speak from. Stuart Hall on cultural identity writes that it is not only a matter of being, but becoming. What is he telling us is that identities are constantly being transformed and transcends time and space. So this photo is not when I was at Goldsmiths College, which I'm going to tell you about, but this photo is actually me at high school in Trinidad. And yes, I did have hair on my head back then. I used to actually you know, support the Afro. So as an undergraduate student at Goldsmiths College, I was fortunate to attend a lecture by Stuart Hall in 1997. That lecture was entitled Race, the Floating Signifier. Here, race is viewed as a concept in permanent transition, reflecting society's reimagining and inventing of itself. I am a black male from the Caribbean. Therefore, I come from slave ancestry. The Caribbean was colonized by the British, and slave labor was used to grow sugarcane and cocoa and coffee plantations. They worked to produce sugar and cocoa and coffee for drinks for export to Britain and wider Europe. This, how did the slaves arrive in, in Trinidad? Well, there was one way. This was through the triangular slave trade. It's where ships sail between Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean, or the Americas. Ameri African people were captured and sold into slavery. The journey was horrendous, and many died contracting diseases such as scurvy. It's important to understand that when I talk about how African people were captured into slavery. Um, they were battered, they were sold. But 
because the triangular trade was going from island to island, so, you know, we have the Caribbean islands. I'm going to call the main islands. You know, you have Barbados, you have Jamaica, you have Trinidad and Tobago, you go on further, you have Guyana, and you have these islands. And so the ship went island to island, and therefore the slave families, the, or the Africans who were captured, they were often separated, because a slave plantation owner in Jamaica may buy my brother. And my brother will then be sold to somebody else in, in Trinidad, for example. So, so families were split up. And these included women and, and children to some extent. So, because children were used in the slave master's house. You know, they had the small hands. They could do things. One of the important things to note is that identity of most African Caribbean people are not known because they were stolen and captured and they were split up, as I said. However, their culture remained with them. That is their practices and traditions. And as slaves, my ancestors were not taught to read or write. Few slave owners would actually educate their slaves. Because if you were educated, it means you became out of your station and you may want to do other things. I am fortunate that education was free for me. And I even came to this country and I was educated at doctoral level. So living conditions were far from standard or minimum for slaves. So why did my slave ancestors, why did my slave ancestors' identity subject them to racism? And more so, why does this identity around being black continue to thrive with racism today? A possible answer is that we were sold into, and some of us born into a situation where our self-worth was not valued. And this has impacted on our confidence and our ability to perform. And so our reward is a devalued self through operationalized racism. Next slide, please. Looking at the construction of racism, it's important to understand that race and the racism we face today has been endorsed by early philosophers such as Immanuel Kant, who built on the works of David Hume, who drew on the works of Linnaeus in 1707 to 1778. Linnaeus classified four races, well, classified race into four types. Firstly, Homo Europaeus, who were the whites, and they were described as civilized because they lived by rules and customs. There's Homo Americus, who were your Native Americans, and they were described as tenacious, and they were governed by their habits. There was Homo Asiaticus, who are what we call Asians, and they were described by Linnaeus as stern, greedy, and they lived and led by opinion. There was Homo Afri, described as cunning, slow to think, careless, and governed by caprice. So, you know, we lived on a whim, basically, they were saying, because I identify with, with the fourth group. A point to note here is that race was classified based on observation. And Linnaeus classified, contextualizes his observation in terms of skin color and behavior. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so Homo Europius, in Linnaeus' words, were of fair complexion, sanguine temperament, and brawny. People of gentle manners, acute of judgment, of quick intervention, and governed by fixed laws. Homo Afri was of black complexion, Plumagetic temperament and relaxed fiber were of crafty, indolent, often crafty, sorry, indolent and careless disposition and are governed in their actions by caprice. So we begin to see there's this description. Interestingly for me, when I was a doctoral student, because the P in PhD stands for philosophy, and my supervisors always told me I had to go and learn about philosophers. And most of you who engage at master's level reading and, and doctoral level, you have been told to go and read the work of philosophers. And here I was sent to philosophers who I never knew actually endorsed racism and created racism. Um, Kant and Hume were very clear on racism themselves. So next slide, please. Kant, um, during, Kant and Hume during the period 1711 to 76, they were occupied with race northward we we'll occupy with race and racial thoughts and, uh, and how we begin to classify and view racism. What is really important to note is that their writings was based on instinctive thinking rather than science. 
And if you want to understand a little bit more about the, the science of raciology, read Kurt Bartling's book on racism. And he, he goes a lot deeper into Kant and Hume and Linnaeus. So I would say they weren't instinctive writing. I would actually say it was arrogance because they had never met a black individual, nor did they observe black people. Remember I said they were building on the works of Linnaeus, Kant and Hume. So they never encountered black people, yet they saw it fit to make the judgments of black people and their temperament, black people and their disposition, black people and their actions being governed by a whim, a caprice as such. So to place, to place what Hume and Kant were doing into context, it's like you and I diagnosing a patient that we have never spoken to or examined, but only heard by really. Hume in 1974 wrote, I am apt to suspect the Negroes in general and in all species of men, because he believed there were three or four different kinds, to be naturally inferior to the whites. There was never a, never a civilized of any other complexion than white. And here we see we begin to make the notion that white people are civilized. People who are not of white complexion, people without a white complexion were seen to be less civilized or uncivilized. Kant was very clear about mixing races or, or you know, interracial relationships and marriages and children like we know today. This is what he said. This we can judge with probability that the intermixture of races caused by large-scale conquests, which gradually extinguishes their characteristics, does not seem beneficial to the human race. So basically you're saying mixing of the races is not going to be beneficial. There is no benefit. And we saw this was really even followed through in the times of, of Adolf Hitler. He was trying to go for one pure race. So in terms of racism, and interracial marriages and, and stuff. Here we have, when we looked at pure European and pure African resided, these concepts resided in countries where slavery existed because you had to be pure. So simply put, if you had one drop of African blood in your body, you were black. So you were born into and inherited a system of prejudice, a system that presented barriers and views that every ethnic minority is are lesser than their white counterparts, because those views continue to prevail today. I work in clinical practice, and I remember once going to a hospital, which I shall not name, to do an agency shift when I was a doctoral student. And the nurse kept hanging around me and telling me, are you sure you know how to use this ventilator? To the point where I turned around and I had to say to him, these ventilators are in the museum in Trinidad we train on much, we have much more sophisticated ventilators. Because he kept coming back and thinking I was of lesser, and my country was of lesser. We didn't have such established systems. So these systems prevail today for nurses as well. And particularly, so where we're seen as less in terms of our white counterparts, and less in terms of technology that's being used here. Next slide, please. In the next part, I want to focus on how inheritance of racism begins to kill nurses. So how is racism killing nurses? Racism has been killing nurses for decades. The National Health Service is a beacon service. It is a world-renowned service. It is a service where uh, care is still free at point of entry. Yet nurses die at its hands. For example, in the post-World War II period, people from the Caribbean nations were invited to come to Britain to help build the NHS among other areas such as transport, textile, steel, coal, and iron. And you can see here in my slide, um, I have a picture of, of, of you know, Caribbean people who have come to help. It was an SOS, and Professor Laura Saron really nicely captures that in her poem, You Called and We Came. If you haven't heard this poem, I suggest you go and look up um, a reading of, of one of Professor Saron's poem. So, where are we now? We're at a stage where the National Health Service needed help, and they sent out an SOS call, and nurses came. So those nurses who came to help build the National Health Service were not always treated with respect, with dignity, or with fairness. But they were often marginalized and discriminated as part of racism and colonialism. 
They were known as the Windrush Generation, named after the Empire Windrush, the vessel that brought them here to England, which docked in Tilbury. Decades later, the Windrush scandal erupted. Hundreds of Caribbean migrants were targeted under the guise of the government's hostile immigration policies. Caribbean migrants of the Windrush generation were denied healthcare treatment during the scandal, and it was well publicized in one of the newspapers here in England, where one gentleman from Caribbean ancestry or Windrush generation, he was denied treatment for his prostate cancer. He was told he had to pay £64,000 for it if he wanted it. Uh, but one of the important things about Windrush and repatriating or Repatriating is one word you could say. Um, the other word is sending you back to your country. Um, you know, there's so many immigration terms, but one of the ways of looking at this view of, you know, sending Caribbean people back to their home nation, saying they weren't entitled to live here, was that it's a way of removing black people out of British history. And when you remove the Windrush generation, you are also removing a part of the nursing history. And by deporting people of Windrush generation back to the Caribbean, it was a deliberate move to remove the historical contribution of this group to post-World War II Britain. A more apt term for me is racial hygiene towards people of Caribbean heritage, because we were basically being whitewashed. Um, a more apt term may be racial hygiene towards people of Caribbean heritage. Looking at today's NHS workforce culture, there's this idea of encouraging health workers to come to Britain and work. It is called international recruitment. It's very similar to the SOS that went out to the Windrush generation. So my talk to you is let us not let history repeat itself of the hardship and racial prejudice the Windrush nurses experienced to prevail again with our international recruits. Organizations and society have a duty towards international recruits. Of course, on the ground, I am hearing stories of families who are separated as they are advised they should not bring their spouses or children with them. I use the academic word advice. They're probably more or less told not to bring them. Employer-assisted accommodation is not only provided for a limited time, is only, sorry, provided for a limited time, and they are not fully orientated to the British way of life. These are all subtleties of racism that contribute to killing nurses. Fast forward to 2020, and we have seen, next slide please, we have seen the disproportionate deaths of black and ethnic minority nurses as a result of the COVID pandemic. I mean, our data here shows for England that of the 10,841 cases of COVID-19 among nurses, midwives, and nursing associates, which represents 1.9% of the Nursing and Midwifery Council Register, 1,456 were in men. The median age of cases for men and women were 45.5 to 41.1 years old. Among workers in occupations more likely to be exposed to diseases such as healthcare, three in four were women and one in five were from Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. Those with Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, and other Caribbean and Black heritage faced between 10 and 50 times higher risk of death than white British people. I remember students saying at a webinar, they were scared. Black students who have children and families at home were saying to their academic lecturers, we are scared, we do not know what to do. And this whole idea of colonialism erupted in one person's response to them that I noted. This person responded, you should consider it a privilege to serve the British public. So in serving the British public, some people were happy to send us to die. Important to understand here is that COVID-19 virus is not discerning of race. However, in true fashion of a virus, it chooses its host. It usually, its host usually provides a space that is conducive for it to replicate and thrive. What we have learned though, so far, are that those that are exposed to societal inequalities provide the conducive environment 
And here we see how COVID-19 binds itself to those that have experienced inequalities through the medium of structural racism. So structural racism, most of you may be asking, what is this? It's not merely a result of personal, private, and public health prejudices. It is to do with, but about those produced and reproduced rules, laws, and practices that are sanctioned and oftentimes implemented and embedded by our ward level, our organization hospital level, and government through economic, cultural, and social systems. Social, structural racism, the private and the public are held views and prejudices are those where those who are in positions of authority in hospitals make their private view public through policies and regulations for employees. Now you may begin to see clearer how the Windrush scandal was linked to structural racism and how slavery created a space for capitalism and economic development of Europe. So one of the things is, this is very much aligned to international recruitment as well. Are we now in a modern day economic and capitalistic development of, of Britain, and we're encouraging international recruitment? So if you want to learn more about slavery and capitalism, and examine how it aligns to some of these practices I just outlined today. You may want to read the thesis of Dr. Eric Williams. He was the first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, and his doctoral thesis is held at Oxford University, which he did in 1944. Um, next slide, please, or the last slide. I'm coming to a close on. I want to end um, with um, this slide. Um, it's a couple of verses from Psalm 62. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down? This leaning wall, this tottering fence, surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless us, but in their hearts they curse us. Some black nurses have become the wall and the fence. That is, they are the structural support and shield, if not protector, of others in our community when addressing racial equality and racism. One such thing is the RES report, or the RES, and Yvonne Coggill, who has led and developed the RES, as can be seen as one of those, you know, leaning wall, those, those fences that are built. Similarly, some organizations have sought to topple these walls and fences. In everyday practices, the black roots, black grassroots frontline nurses are being racially assaulted in how they are treated, talked about and spoken to, this in turn is racial harassment and incivility. And um, this is seen by patients and by staff and colleagues you work with. And the, res, the latest RES report acknowledged that um, incivility and harass, racial harassment is high. Um, there's 30.3% of BME staff report such experiences from colleagues, patients, and their relatives. How many times has it been noted that an organization is being racist in their actions? For example, the data around the NMC, which is the regulatory body for nurses, midwives, and health visitors, demonstrates that black nurses are overrepresented in fitness to practice cases. Worthy of note is that the employer is more likely to refer a black nurse to fitness to practice than a patient. And a patient is more likely to refer a white nurse. And in terms of outcome, a black nurse receives a more severe penalty compared to their white counterparts. How much is all of this linked to those works and observations on racism and construction of race implemented by Kant and Hume and Linnaeus based on our complexion, based on our identity? Our name alone gives us away sometimes. It tells people who we are and that begins to reverberate the, the, or reignite the Kant and Hume in some of our white colleagues, where they begin to see us as lesser, as incivil, as not being cunning, as acting on a whim, when we know this is not the case. So as nurse leaders, we need to begin to look at how we actually take apart the human Kant from us 
and approach things as being allies and work in coalition with our black nurses. Finally, as a nurse leader, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the current situation at the Royal College of Nursing and how, in my view, racism is operationalized. Here we see a college that praised some national black nurse leaders and at the same cursed them inwardly till the intent of toppling was achieved. My message to all black nurses is that you need to have confidence in as well as value yourself and believe you can when organizations and individuals you seek support from have failed you. The current situation and climate is ripe for all organizations, including the Royal College of Nursing, to approach racism and weed it out. You know, in the words of Bob Marley, <clears throat> most of you know Bob Marley, reggae singer from Jamaica. Bob Marley sang, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Perhaps organizations and individuals, it's organizations and individuals that need to free their minds of the concept of racism. And I hope in all the reviews that's going on at the Royal College of Nursing, that they are able to emancipate themselves from the thinking of humankind. My closing remarks to all nurses in this lecture are racism kills. Therefore, there is an urgency. Final slide, please. Therefore, there is an urgency to unite in the fight against racism. Because post Floyd and Black Lives Matter, the fight seems to be waning. And therefore, there is a need for non-racist and anti-racist practice as a necessity for the nursing profession to grow and develop. Leadership needs to rise against racism and in so doing, provide security and assurance. Leadership, I am talking to chief nurses, I am talking to heads of nursing, matrons. You need to use your position and actually provide race security and assurance for your staff. Finally, one of the lessons from COVID-19 is that transformation can take place in weeks rather than years. Therefore, racial thinking needs to be centralized. It's a slow pandemic racism. And the events of 2019, 2020 accelerated it for us. My last question to you is, how will you treat the pandemic of racism? Thank you for attending this lecture. I look forward to our Q&A. Thank you so much for that, Calvin. That was really, that was absolutely fascinating. And there were so many um, themes that came through in this that have been echoed I think in the comments, which we will come to very shortly. So uh, welcome colleagues to the Mary Seacole Lecture with Professor Calvin Morley and myself, Wendy Irwin, the RCN's Equalities Lead. Um, Calvin, I'd like to just start with a question before we go into some of the things that have shown up in the commentary. Um, and I've got a couple of questions, if I may. And the first question is, what is the difference between, um, well, what is non racism and how does it differ from anti-racism? Ah, thank you, Wendy. Uh, and thank you everyone for who have attended um, this afternoon evening's lecture. Um, it's a privilege to be here and uh, answer this question. So being anti-racist, let's start with that, is when you become actively conscious and aware of both race and racism, and you begin to look at how you can take actions against racism. So you then you begin to develop this understanding and this knowledge. And um, you believe that also when you become anti-racist, you believe racism is everyone's problem. OK, so it, it's different um, for white people in that it is for people of color when we talk about being anti-racist. Um, <clears throat> and when we begin to look at non-racist, it's really and truly, we're beginning to look and say, how can we begin to be this person that doesn't see race as the barrier? How we begin to decolonize and remove those, those barriers and those structures that actually prevent equity. And so, you know, being anti-racist, you probably really look at inequality and equality. With being non-racist, you're aligned to looking at equity, that everyone has the same um everyone has the same opportunity as such 
Thank you so much, Calvin. Um, just another question from me, and these are emerging, I think, in some of the kind of comments that we're seeing. But we hear a lot about structural racism and your, your lecture kind of really beautifully kind of weaves that into your arguments about how racism is killing nursing. But I wonder if you might, for everyone that's fairly new to this agenda, be able to describe what you mean by structural racism. What is it and how do we recognize it when we come across it? So structural racism, let's start with um, interpersonal racism. If we look at what is interpersonal racism, and in my lecture, I talk about the private and the publicly held views. So interpersonal racism starts with your private held views. Those views that you believe, like when I give the example of the nurse who thought, because I was black and from the Caribbean, I didn't know how to use a ventilator. And, was, and I had to actually, you know, just in just say, these ventilators are so old, we have them in the museum in Trinidad. That's because people hold up that private belief that, you know, you may not be able to do something or based on your color, based on like what Hume and, and, and Kant were saying, based on our color, you know, we, we, we don't actually rationalize things. We act on a whim, we act on a caprice, on a, you know, of the moment. So these privately held views, you take them into the workplace and they become that interpersonal racism. So you may think, well, that person is black, they can't do that. Or, or they shouldn't be applying for that job. And then you actually make the opportunity. And we see this in everyday work, okay? So for example, you may see, look, the position is coming up to be, you know, a director or a charge nurse or whatever it is, because, you know, I straddle academic and clinical practice. So I'm looking at both situations here. And you may get this impression, um, you, that, you know, well, this person, she's got a husband and she's got two children and they're black, they're, they're family or type people. She doesn't want to do this job. So you never opened it up to her or him as such. But what you do is you go to your white colleagues who you think, oh, this is ideal for them. You know, they're a rising star. They're, they're, they're the talent we need to, you know, identify and build on. And you totally, because of your health view, that someone from this particular background, because they have two children, they may no longer want to excel in their, or excel rather, in their profession. So you exclude them. And in the meantime, you put your white colleague in, and I see this happen lots of times. People say, oh, why don't you go and shadow Wendy? Because she's giving up the rotational post in six months. At least you will get some experience. But they come and they tell their white colleague to do that. They, go, they don't put an email out or they don't tell everyone. They select who they want to do. And that's how interpersonal racism begins. Structural racism, on the other hand, is when those interpersonal beliefs, those private health beliefs and interpersonal interactions now become part of policy, rules, and regulation. And you see very clearly with the um, Windrush era that I used, the Windrush nurses, that was a form of structural racism with the, you know, the hostile immigration policies of the government. But also we see, operating in workplaces and, and how these structures that lead to the inequity among people, these, these are the policies and the rules and the regulations that drive inequity in organizations and teams, really. Thank you. Thank you. And one more before we go to our uh, the questions that have been uh, placed by our audience members. And there is a, a question from Anonymous. Uh, and I think it's a, an interesting one. Uh, the question is, uh, or the comment is, at least overt racism is a known problem and is readily acknowledged with decades of work to remedy it. When are gender and sexuality going to be on the same scale? And whilst you think about how you are going to respond to this, Calvin, I one of the things I'd like you to kind of um, perhaps bring into this conversation is, is it always this kind of, uh, I suppose, this binary that either we are discussing race or we're discussing something else? Is there never space to actually understand that in the space of race lie, lie many other protected characteristics as well? So wanted your take on that one. So just it's the comment that uh, at least overt racism is a known problem and is readily acknowledged with decades of work to remedy it. When are gender and sexuality going to be on the same scale? I'd love your response to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Anonymous. Um, you must sit in some of my lectures, I think, Anonymous at the university. Uh, I think 
one of the first things is to look at an intersectional approach. So I think I am one of the, the living example and proof that I am um, a black man, I'm from the Caribbean and I'm gay. So I bring that intersectional approach to when I, I go and I talk about racism. And then we know that there's racism within uh, sexual minority groups. We know there's racism um, from different gender perspectives, how they're, how they're also viewed. So I think this, the time is now, basically, when you're asking, when will we do it? Now is the time, as I said in my talk, the time is right for organizations such as the Royal College of Nursing, such as universities, any other large organizations, the National Health Service, the time is right for us to review these areas and actually look at how we take an intersectional approach to this. So it's not just looking at it in a binary, a binary position, but saying actually, and this is something I learned, you know, as I said in my lecture, I was a Mary Siegel scholar. And one of the first things, or one of the things, lessons I learned from the Mary Siegel program was how to take an intersectional approach. That when I go to a meeting or when I discuss people's health, I don't just say, black people, but I say black women, black men, gay men, lesbian women, that you actually, and that was one of the benefits, you know, I had people like Professor Carol Baxter mentoring me and teaching me at the Royal College back then. So it was really worth, um, the Mary Seacole Awards were really worth, for me, it was really worth it then when I did it, you know, I left it a lot. So intersectionality is the thing, and I think the time is now, so I would say to everyone, when you do go to your meetings, Call it out for us and say to people, we need to have an intersectional approach. And most large organizations are going for charter marks such as Athena Swan and Race Equality Charter. Those things have to take an intersectional approach. So if you want to get more involved as well to make sure you get that on the table, I would say join those groups in your organization that, you know, working towards these charters so you can take your perspective about this intersectional approach. Thank you, Calvin. And I can see uh, from the comments and from the Q&A that uh, Shelley Pierce has said and, and absolutely identified intersectionality. We can all be othered. Uh, and I thought really that's a really, really powerful comment. I'd like to uh, move to a question from Kylie McDonald, uh, McDonald rather. Uh, and Kylie asks and says that I'm a white nurse on the shop floor, not a manager. If I see racism, I will challenge it. But other than that, what can I do to help? So Calvin, what would be your response to Kylie's question? So Kylie, I think the first thing is, um, well done and thank you for the question, you know, that you call racism out when you see it. Um, it's also how you begin to educate your colleagues to be on that level with you. So you're not always calling it out as such. So I, when you said call it out, I assumed a mound, you know, um, colleagues, but it may be with patients as well when we work in clinical practice. So I think one of the good things you can do is to begin to look at how you share your education. And it might just be bite-sized chunks of things you can do. I know we're all busy in clinical practice and there's so much happening. Uh, one of the things I did in, one of, in the organization where I work is that we recognize that the whole of the senior management were all white people. And what we did was we formed a strategic advisory group or you know a race or a black strategic or a bme strategic advisory group where we started advising we didn't say look hey you must appoint us because we're black we're saying actually you all make decisions that concern us as employees therefore you need to have a voice we need to have a voice so therefore we can advise you on certain matters um, and and that works really well so you may want to start something on a really smaller bite-sized chunk like that of how you know you become a strategic group to advising colleagues or individual you know uh, of just having posters up of the month you know you have a theme every month of something around how you can challenge racism and that probably will kind of highlight that racism is a problem and how you know colleagues other colleagues who are thinking like you may be able to um you know support people thank you thank you uh, and kylie i would also add that uh we lead at every single every single level. So if we accept that we are CEOs of self, the environments that we're in can be really good environments to be clear with people about where our values are uh, and where we are very clear about drawing lines of accountability. So I wonder if your position is is as important as your passion um, uh, to, to actually create a, a really great environment where all colleagues can thrive. Thank you. 
Calvin, I'd like to move to a question that has uh, had some interesting kind of commentary in the Q&A. Uh, and it was started by BJ Waltho, who asked a question about whether or not reverse mentoring or reciprocal mentoring, as it's sometimes called, can be useful as a tool to tackle issues of racism. And in the comments, we've had a couple of people, some say that, yeah, they've found it a really good experience. Others who are currently engaging in reverse mentoring, not entirely sure. So it'd be really great to get your take on whether or not the role that reverse mentor is, reverse mentoring has in this space of working towards an anti-racist organization. So I think it has got a role. Um, it's important, so thank you, BJ. Um, you know, Congress wasn't live, so I couldn't see you, um, but it's, it's nice to hear your question. Um, so thank you so much um, in terms of when we look at um, reverse mentoring. So for those who aren't, aren't clear, let's just talk a little bit about what reverse mentoring. So um, we, we started using it in race, but it probably really had its origin when we started seeing younger people teaching their parents and their grandchildren how to use IT. That's a little bit of reverse mentoring when you use a younger person. But here in race and reverse mentoring, what we do is we use um, normally, as I was saying earlier on, you know, in my organization, all the senior management were white and there were no black people. It's the same thing here. So you have no, um, what you have is, a, a, it's you, to use Roger Klein's terms, you know, the snowy white peaks. Um, you have all the white people at the top, but they need to, in order for them to begin to make changes, um, reverse mentoring opens up that epistemistic space where people can talk and share narratives. So you get someone who is black or from a minority group. And I, I, I'm not apologizing, but as I said in my talk, I identify anyone as non-white as black, okay? So I'm not ignoring any other races when I just say black. Um, so you get someone from a black um, ethnicity or race as such to come and mentor the person who is white. And that person really and truly begins to hear and understand the narrative and the trajectory and um, we have done this really well where I work right now. We have done this. And um, it, it opens up that space to share and learn about different cultures and perspectives. So there is a space where what you may find is that you may not get all the leverage you want from it because it's not a quick fix. What reverse mentoring really does, it opens up that space so that you can understand. So the next time you are in a position and you're interviewing someone, so for example, more recently, I was interviewing for a PhD candidate. Um, the candidate just couldn't give the answers, you know. Um, I, I, even I was getting frustrated, but it was with two other white colleagues. And um, in the end, you know, one of the colleagues said they've made a lot of notes that, you know, they can give feedback to because we thought they wouldn't accept the, the, the candidate. And I just said, listen, think about it this way. You ask him questions you were expecting a white man to give you white answers to. What he told you was, he didn't tell you, I have the critical analysis skills and I can do this and I can do in-depth discussion and synthesis. I said, because you're expecting a white person to say that. I said, but what we were assessing was critical thought, critical understanding, critical insight. And this student told you, I see a problem. This is a problem. So that's criticality in its own right to identify. I said, he told you, I think by doing a PhD, I'd be able to contribute to knowledge and help this group. So he has the critical stance of what to look for and what to do. It's just he wouldn't give you the answers you were expecting. And then after the interview, we went in and, and talk, I started talking about when you listen to black people speak and you understand their perspective, you begin to, and the two other members, my colleagues were really, you know, the, the, they weren't shocked, but they were pleased that I was there to explain that to them because they'd never seen it. And this is part about reverse mentoring as well. It does this thing. It helps you to decolonize the situations that other people live in, and then you begin to understand better. So there is a role. It may not achieve everything we want, but it is a move towards racial equality and inequities, you know, reducing those. So I, I would say it works. Thank you so much, Calvin. We've got some delightful questions coming up in the uh, commentary. So I'm really going to try my hardest to kind of get through um, them. There was one from uh, Rosemary that uh, I felt was particularly emotive. Um, and Rosemary 
asked a question um, about how do you raise, how does one raise issues of racism within an organization, with a manager, without being seen as a troublemaker? In other words, how does one rock the boat and still remain oh, in it? Um, I, I, first of all, Wendy, I have to say, I hope the audience realizes you are seeing these questions and I'm not seeing them. So I know nothing that's coming towards me. It's like, it's like a Christmas present, you know? Am I gonna like it or am I not gonna like it? Um, but anyway, thank you, Rosemary. <clears throat> I think once you, you decide that you are going to um, talk about racism and race issues and questions around racism, um, if you upset the apple cart and that nice, you know, little pickety um, white fence with a beautiful house scenario we have, or, you know, the perfect office and the perfect work situation, you will be seen as a troublemaker. But I think it's how you approach it. Um, probably don't approach it always on your own. It's good to have allies. So talk to someone else and say, I think this is an issue. Do you think we could approach the manager together? So, you know, there, there, is, there is that strength and in, in unity in numbers, as we say. So that would be one way. But I think also your wider organization should have some form of, you know, of an EDI organization, you know, or a committee that could really give you some tips. They, you know, without saying, you know, just like what you're asking here, you can go to them and say, look, I am seeing this happening and I want to really approach my manager. Can you tell me when I'd be the best way possible? And they should be able to help you because they also know your internal politics and culture and how you go about things. Um, so that may be one step um, or one way to do it. I think the second thing is, as I said, when um, you always have to have faith in yourself, there's something about self-belief and self-confidence and self-worth. So when you believe in yourself, you also have, you believe in the value of yourself and, and your own self-worth. So by you having belief in yourself, you know you're gonna do something and that some, is something for the good. So gain your confidence and you know, be prepared to be knocked back because people will knock you back. They will tell you this is not a problem. We don't have this problem here. So you may need to have some examples with you when you go to meet your manager and say, well, you know, thank you. But when in my experience, while I've been here, this is what I've noticed. And you can raise it that way. So don't just, because people will tell you, oh, it's not a problem. No one wants to say they have a problem with racism in their organization. That, that, that's the truth of the matter. So it's how you approach that with your evidence. <clears throat> thank you. Thank, thank you. So uh, some really, really great questions and comments coming in from our amazing kind of audience. Uh, there's one here from uh, Sadaf Navid, um, who asks really a question that I would sort of think is around this, the theme of kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, it says ethnic <coughs> minority nurses don't apply for higher grade jobs because they believe that they are not going to get it because of their ethnicity. How do we change that? So there's something then about um, talented people not going for jobs because their perceptions and their beliefs that they're not going to get the job so that they stay in those roles. How do we overcome that sense of it being a self-fulfilling prophecy, Calvin? Um, so a, you recognize, you look at the job criteria, okay, and you recognize it. You recognize that you have met it and you're going to go for it. And um, listen, I didn't become professor by the first interview I did, okay? I will tell you this now. I, I, I was even knocked down before interview stage. And this is what people don't tell you sometimes. But you have to actually be strong and realize that you can do it. Um, and I think there, there's two parts here. There's, there's something about you but there's also something about the organization you work for or the organization you wish to work for or move to work for. So we, we see clearly that um, you know, we have lots of um, really good role models of chief nurses who are now from ethnic minority backgrounds. So for example, you have Karen Bonner, you have Avia Bhatia, you know, and you, you have these people who are, who are in positions as such. Um, you have Arlene Williams and, um, so what you do is you begin to realize there are people who've gotten there. So there's no reason why you can't um, believe you can do it. Um, so one, there's organization, OK, the organization ethos and its principles on how they believe um, whether they go for the snowy white peaks of the NHS or they actually go for a really good mix. You know, as we will say back home, a rice cook up, it's got black eyed peas and rice and everything in it. So you've got all the mixtures of colors. Um, so that's what you probably want to go for. 
So your organization should have a clear, transparent um, process of applying. And, who, and, and for organizations, you should have people who are represented on panels. And also it comes back to that last comment I made about that decolonizing interview process. Organizations need to know it's not just about putting a black person on a panel or a black female or a black male or that whole intersectional approach. It's actually saying that the whole panel is aware and they understand what a decolonized interview is like. And I think this is one of the things organizations need to look at, how they decolonize their interview process. Because many a times, even I have gone for jobs and I was told, oh, on the day, the other candidate just answered better than you. Well, actually, they probably, they, they probably were more articulate than I am, but I have more of that experience. So we need interview panels to really begin to understand and decolonize their interview process. And also, the Black people on, or who are on panels, they should have a voice. Normally, Black people aren't senior in organizations, in the, particularly in the NHS, we know this. So when you have one token Black person on a panel, and that person the, um, is from a lower grade, they don't feel empowered to speak up. They, they have lost their voice. So they're, they're just there's a tick box exercise. So I think organizations really need to look at that. You individually have to come back, as I said, and believe you can do it. And, and as I said, you have to believe in yourself, but it's not just about resilience. Find your allies within that organization. Find people who you're gonna mentor and trail. Black people, we tend to do these things where we go for jobs in, in secrecy. We don't want everyone to know. And we have to destroy that myth and find your ally. You know, look at a person who is a band six or band seven and say, can I trail you for half a day or for four hours, if not a whole shift? And, and you build up that relationship. Then you send them the email and you say, thank you, I learned so much, but can I have a little one-to-one -one for one hour with you? And you begin, and that person then begins to profile you. And you begin to profile yourself and you get known. So it's how you also get known in that field where you're going to go for your promotion in as well. Sorry, Wendy, I don't want to talk too much. I realize time is going and you had other questions. No, it's that's a great answer because I think for me that answered uh, a question that Yvonne Myers had about uh, what actions can people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds uh, take to mitigate against the kind of really quite overwhelming effects of, of racism to really kind of propel their career? And so what you've described are some things that absolutely can be done. Um, I also want to just give a quick shout out to Shelley, um, who I think gave a brilliant comment about rocking the boat. Um, learning to swim, uh, rocking the boat is her hobby as a rep. So more power to you, Shelley. Um, what we have seen are, uh, I suppose, a really strong theme coming through from a couple of people, some from uh, who, and one from Anonymous. Um, and this particular comment says that uh, racism has so many facets. There is racism uh, between and within groups and white supremacy is felt on a day-to-day -day basis and we're all affected by generational trauma. Healing has to be a concerted effort. And so Calvin, my question to you is, is thinking about nursing and thinking about where we find ourselves in this trajectory of a pandemic. How does nursing begin to heal from these wounds? What's our first step? I think our first step is to have, I like today, transparent conversations, open conversations that says, I am black and this is how I felt. When I can say to someone, how dare you tell the student nurse who are black women telling you they're scared of their children and going into a pandemic, how dare you tell them it's a privilege to serve the British public, okay? So it's to be able to have those transparent conversations. Nursing can, because if we don't have transparent conversations, it's like, you know, I'm going to be very West Indian here, but and I'll, re I'll refer to English. It's like you put in a plaster on a bobo. A bobo is an ulcer. You haven't cleaned it. You haven't done anything. You just put a plaster on it and you expect it to heal. No, you have to treat it. So part of racism is open, transparent speaking. And we need to have that now. And after we've spoken and listened, then we need to mobilize action and thoughts or mobilize thoughts and words into actions. So now, how do organizations recognize that, you know, the pandemic isn't over, it's subsiding, but it's not over? How do we continue to protect black nurses in the workplace? How do we then begin to mitigate against this unequal or imbalance of white versus blacks when one in five NHS staff 
is from an ethnic minority background, how do we then begin to mitigate that they occupy the, the lower hierarchy of the profession or their profession, whatever it is? So we need to begin for nursing. <clears throat> I think we are really good. We have a wonderful CNO who is, you know, working with us in terms of race and racism and being anti-racist. Health Education England, Mark Radford is also working very closely with us and doing this. So we need the other organizations, like I said, the time is right for the Royal College of Nursing, which most nurses turn to and the other unions, to begin to look at how, after the transparent conversations, how do we move from those, you know, when I talk about the private and the public, that public view of structural racism of policies, how do we move beyond that? How do we move to that to actually say, now we're going towards an equitable stance? So the first step of healing is talking. It's like in any relationship. If you're, if you're, you're in a relationship or even if you have a friendship and one of your friends does something against you, if you don't talk, we don't develop and grow. So the first point of nursing is having probably more of these. I think Felicia Quack is doing a great job with the CNOB and the Strategic Advisory Group. She has these conversations. We do have them. And I think that's the first step. The second step may take slightly longer, but as I said, what happens, you know, one of the things is we've seen through the pandemic, what has taken years of transformation is has happened in days, okay? So we don't have to wait too long to have actions against racism. Organizations can start having really good outcome plans of how they want to address racism. And by doing that also how nursing here. So I think we need to have a regulatory body that actually acknowledges they do a disservice to nurses in terms of when we look at the fitness to practice statistics. So the, our regulatory body needs a total overhaul in terms of how they address racism, how they actually not just draw on their panel members knowledge, but how do they actually educate and, and train their panel members to deal with, with, with nurses and registrants who are from an ethnic minority background. So we need that in terms of organizations. They need to change their mindset. Organizations need to change their mindset. Organizations also need to look at how they provide spaces, really safe spaces for nurses to have these conversations. It's really easy during the pandemic that people sit behind screens or keyboards and type anonymously, okay? It gives them power. Um, you know, what needs to move on is that we have to have the open space where we can show our faces, where we can speak and, and have that safe space. And most importantly, nurses need to be listened to. Nurses need to be listened to and they need, they need to be heard. We need, I, I, I think I've said it, I've given quite a few talks. And one of the things I said we need to move is beyond allyship, but into coalition. So a coalition, you know, is a group that is formed for a common purpose. It's not longstanding. It's quite short. So we need to have coalition now and work towards how we end racism in nursing and how it moves on as a profession. Of course, I think the final thing is once, once we have eliminated um, racism in nursing as a profession, then we move on or simultaneously what we are doing is providing better patient care. Because my colleague who I recognize as from a minority background or a black nurse and who has experienced racism, I also can transfer their experience to the patient. And therefore we provide much better, you know, patient safety care in terms of population health and race as well. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. Um, just from the comments we're seeing, um, people are really appreciating your honesty and your candor in this space. Um, we have so many com we have so many questions um, that there simply isn't time to do justice to them. And I suppose in the last remaining minute, um, I would just want to say thank you, uh, Calvin. This has been, I think, a timely, important, and necessary conversation. And as Claire Picton says, sometimes it makes for uncomfortable listening um, and I think that that's important to recognize that as we lean into change there are going to be some uncomfortable things ahead but we know that we do this for the purpose of actually creating a profession that is fit to house the diversity of the human spirit and why is that important well I believe firmly that nursing is worth it and I hope all of you do too so we are now at uh, we've now come to the end of our lecture 
thank you so much for joining us on this platform. Thank you so much, Calvin. Thank you so thank much you to the event organizing teams. Thank you for all of you that uh, answered and offered uh, questions. But I think now is the chance for us to head back to the main stage to hear from our brand new president, uh, Dr. Denise Schaffer. Thank you all very much, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.